Bayern. He's pushing very this idea very hard over the uh, uh, last decades, and he's also uh, based in the UK and uh, living building to try and end the center. Please, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, m many thanks for uh, organizing today and two great presentations to, to start with. And, and I think what I'm going to say is going to uh, in, in part reinforce what we've just heard and hopefully push the thinking forward a bit. Um, but yeah, sustainability from restorative to regenerative. I think it's absolutely brilliant that within the um, Restore Action and in, in the working groups, we're actually debating what sustainability means, what restorative sustainability means, and what regenerative sustainability means. There aren't many people, many organisations, much research in that field. And I know we're challenging uh, we're being challenged by these definitions. I, I think it's absolutely brilliant as, as, as to where we are. What I want to do in the next uh, few minutes, or 30 minutes or so, is just share some insights from the stuff I've been doing, but more so from the work of the Working Group 1, which has been looking at these, these definitions and the aspects of uh, regenerative sustainability. And I, I think it's important to go back to where Restore came from, what Restore actually stands for. There's some very key words in here because we're rethinking sustainability. And we're certainly doing that with it within the working groups towards a regenerative economy. Now, I think those last two words are incredibly important a regenerative economy. And we're, we're starting to understand what that might mean. And the second thing from the, the uh, Restore Action, which I think is incredibly important, that we need to bear in mind all the time. Is that our mission is to affect the paradigm shift in education and in practice. And that means we need to disseminate what, a, lot, a lot of what we're doing, not only in cost uh, sessions like this, but in conferences, in everyday work, influence in practices, influence in education. And Carlo, you mentioned the uh, training school. I'll talk about that in a moment, but just whilst we're thinking about education. Educating children in primary school, secondary school, about the basics of global change, Climate change, sustainability, is so important. Just want to take you back 30 years and look around the room. I think there are some of us still working in construction, design, architecture, uh, built environment 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the Brundtland definition of uh, our common goal started to define what sustainability, sustainable development means. And that still remains 30 years later as the predominant definition of sustainability. I've summarised it here, to do nothing today to compromise tomorrow's generation. And I think we'll all agree, or we would agree, 30 years ago, that, that, was, that was a very good uh, definition. But if you think back 30 years, mobile phones didn't exist. Mobile phones were the size of a brick. Laptops were not... Uh, even desktops were um, yeah, within one, one room. Um, it was a very different world, and yet we still hang on to this definition. And I think, unfortunately, for many in the built environment, many in practice, in construction, in operations, that's taken to mean do nothing today. We'll sort it out tomorrow. And we'll only do what we're told to do if a building standard tells us to do something or a client wants us to do something. If we can get away with building unsustainable, then we will. If we can get away with only paying for a non-sustainable uh, building, then we will. And when we think about compromising tomorrow's generation, we had and we continue to do so. Um, images of plastic waste because it's, uh, it, it's, it seemed to have caught the imagination and the, the action of many people, uh, certainly in the UK and in Europe and around the world. Driven by the David Attenborough Blue Planet um, series recently, but uh, just yesterday, today, the Queen's announced that all royal properties will ban plastic, plastic straws, plastic drinking bottles. So that, that's going to have a huge impact. And we're familiar with these, what's happening to bird life, what's happening to uh, our, our beauties. We may not be so familiar with what's happening to the next generation. One of the chemicals used in plastic bottles is BPA. Don't ask me to pronounce what BPA is, but it, it's a very invasive uh, chemical. 
And research is starting to show that it's present in teenagers. There was a study done, a research study done in the UK just recently, which looked at a number of uh, uh, teenagers, and they put them on a BPA diet. So for a month or so, they had to live without any known sources of BPA. So that was in uh, food containers and plastic bottles, etc. There were still very high traces of BPA within that within their system. The uh, research is now looking at where is that BPA coming from? Because it's not coming from plastics. There's a big thinking that it may be just be present in our buildings because of the products we put into buildings. And when we look at uh, plastics we use in buildings. Mm -hmm. They're being used. We use 25% of plastics within, within our buildings. Only 19% are recycled or um, re recovered through demolition or, or whatever. They, they end up being, going to land for them to see. And yet, yeah, the BPA is present in 86% of teenagers. So what do we think about com not compromising tomorrow's generation? We, we continue to be unsustainable. And then when we think about the built environments we're creating, and, and, and I must agree with the comments that made this morning, it was wonderful walking into this building to see it by Philip Elements downstairs, and encouraging to hear that uh, commercial buildings are now being built to standard, built to certification. But we're creating this type of city around the world. Um, and we're introducing mental illness through, through these cities. There's the emergence of nostalgia which is a sort of mental distress from remembering things when they were green and now I'm, I'm living in a concrete jungle. <coughs> Carlo mentioned these, and I, I just shortened the, the um, carbon. We're up to 410 parts per million. Scientists tell us we can only exist with 350 parts per million. Worry is, by 2020, that will increase to 500 parts per million. It's going the wrong way. And I think on carbon, we had to start to reimagine carbon. Carbon's essential, it's just in the wrong place. So let's think about getting carbon out of the wrong place and lock it into products, lock it into buildings, lock it back into ecosystems, lock it back into trees, plants, peatlands, etc. We have a, a vision on, on carbon where we are just trying to reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. And I think that's uh, not necessarily the best way to be going. We need to just reimagine carbon. And then when we think about the built environment sector, we're known as the 40% sector. We use 40% of raw materials. 40% of traffic on road is construction or built environment related. We generate 40% waste. At the moment, we're 40% of the, 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 uh, the climate change or the climate disaster, climate breakdown, I would call the, the climate change issue. 40% of the problem. How can we flip that over? So we become 40% of the solution. And to do so, we need restorative and we need regenerative buildings. And we're now starting to use the expression, we don't have the luxury to be less bad, uh, or yeah, let's do less bad and more good. And that's where we need to be. And a long time ago, from even Chinat's Patagonia work, I picked up this um, expression that we should not use the word sustainable. <coughs> until we give as much back as we take. And that's much back to the environment, that much, as much back to nature, but also as much back to society, to the people who work with us. Yeah, it's, it's already been stated this morning. We spend 90% of our time in buildings. We take hell a lot from the people who, who work from, for us. And what are we giving back in terms of work environment, work conditions? So maybe sustainability is not a journey. But it's an equilibrium at this point of where we're given as much back as, as, as we take. And this is a variation of the um, chart we just saw from uh, Carlo's presentation, with sustainable being that equilibrium, that pivot point. And everything to the, uh, yeah, to, the, to, to the left of here could be classed as unsustainable. Everything to the right being sustainable. We are moving from business as usual through, to, through sustainable to, to regenerative, where we're doing more positive good. Um, and I know from experience when working in, in practice and working in buildings and for, for clients, this is hard work, this is tick box mentality. Those certifications are hard work to reduce that impact, reduce impact, reduce impact. 
and we've created a whole bureaucratic industry <coughs> around this. And I think it's time to take the, 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 the blocks off, open the box, and let's be really innovative, let's really go for it. You know, that's where our imagination is, that's where our innovation is, on doing more good. And if you think about it, most people who've gone into the built environment want to do it because they want to make a change. They just want to be reducing impact and doing less bad all the time. You know, let's harness all the, uh, the skills and the uh, uh, innovations and creativity that we do have. People will know that I use a video about uh, wolves. Um, in Yellowstone Park quite, quite often in these days. And I think we can learn a, a lot from nature. And we should be asking the question, what, can, what is nature doing? How could nature solve the problem? How would nature solve, solve the problem of, of the built environment? Climate change issues. So are we just reducing impact when we have all these skills to actually enable a rewilded future, a regenerative future? And I ask this question when I do lots of talks and presentations. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be a less bad version of the built environment we have? Or do we want that built environment that makes the world a better place? And today, no one's voted for this. I could ask you to vote here, we've got electronic votes, etc. And it's overwhelmingly that people want that better, better place. So how do we get there? A quote by that Mr. Fuller <coughs> is that you, you, you don't change things by fighting what's already existing. We need to come up with new ways of doing things, which are more exciting. Um, and in terms and time, make the existing models obsolete. And a few of those are already around today. The sustainable development goals are new positive thinking. And you can see that as a, a, the opposite to the Brentland definition. And this should become our definition for sustainability within clients, within construction, within facilities management, within design practices, within consultants. Working out how we impact um, on, on the global scale and on the local scale against these 17 items. And I can't let a presentation go by without mentioning the uh, Living Building Challenge. Um, there are other uh, standards which are moving away from the BRIAM and the League into a restorative, regenerative future. I've made up at the Living Building Challenge ones here, but we can also look at One Planet Living, we can look at Natural Step, um, and at the Well Built Standard. There are some really good emerging um, standards now. <coughs> so from the Restore Working Group, we set ourselves three elements. What is state of the art on regenerative sustainability? Where do we want to be? Where's the vision? And what, what are the triggers which are going to get us there? I think it's interesting, since we started working in the working groups, in fact, go back since we uh, kicked off this uh, action, and since we started to develop this action two years ago, whenever, things have changed. Paris has come along. Health and well-being have been uh, emerged on the, uh, sorry, risen on the sustainability agenda, and the sustainable, sustainable development goals I've mentioned. But Paris is interesting, and I think it's a huge area of development that needs to, uh, research and etc. How will limiting global uh, temperature increases to 1 degree, 1.5 degree, impact on all our standards, our codes, our building practices? I've used the expression that we'll reset them. I, I think most of our European, um, certainly in the UK, standards are based on not even achieving 2 degrees or three degrees, or four degrees. But now we have to get down to 1.5, and that's a, that's a huge step forward. Um, and I was reading something just recently, that we, we, at the moment we're on trajectory to achieve uh, four degrees. If we do nothing, we'll, we'll end up with a four degree uh, uh, increase by 2050, I think. And then if you look at the um, increase in the population by then, we'll be up to nine billion. Of that nine billion, if we continue on that four degrees, I think 6 billion will be displaced around the world. We'll have a, an e e equator no-go zone. And that will displace 6 billion, 6 billion people. And the thought of that is, yeah, it's a big political issue, isn't it? Um, as I say, at the moment, the built environment has a 40% influence of their banks. And health and well-being, it's very difficult to go to a sustainability conference now, or get involved in the sustainability um, business cases without discussing health and well-being. That was never there 
ten years ago, maybe five years ago, it was never there. And we've moved away from sustainability, just being about energy and resources. It's now a much bigger picture. So, definitions. I've used the expressions restorative and regenerative quite glibly. But, as I say, it, I think it's brilliant that we're debating the difference between these. And we, within the working group, we try to really boil these down into little nuggets. So sustainable is limiting the damage we cause. And that's that balance point between giving back as much as we take. Restorative is where we restore the social, ecological, uh, other uh, ecosystems back to a healthy state. So we're repairing the damage we've done. We get to that point of equilibrium and we've we moved on. And keeping it there. And then regenerative is putting systems in place which enable that emergence of much better things. Um, so we keep those systems at a healthy state, but we have in them mechanisms where they, they can develop and move forward. Um, and then we started to look at what we have there. And we have many um, standards and systems which relate to the sustainability, reducing impact. We have uh, a few which relate to restorative and less so which uh, relate to regenerative. Maybe that's the state of the art. What one um, way which this is starting to be uh, explored and uh, some, some of the thinking from working group one is this evolution from maybe where we work business as usual to sustainable to regenerative. Yeah, before sustainability became an issue, we had what's known man's tyrannical dominate, dominion. We dominated everything. We saw ourselves top of the food chain. We could do anything we, we really wanted to. We've moved into an eco uh, uh, paradigm, if you like, uh, where we see ourselves starting to see ourselves as part of nature. The next stage is to get to that seabill in service and love and harmony. Where we're working uh, in, in harmony with, with nature. And we see ourselves as equals and we see ourselves supporting. And you'll see the shape there is, is, is a heart shape. And this whole idea of love and passion for the planet and environment is missing at the moment. And some very initial work that we're doing is, okay, if we look at all these standards we have, where do they sit on that scale from sustainable to uh, regenerative? And this is the result of a, a, a quick brainstorming. And it's a challenge. Is this right? Is this not right? We're putting this into the um, publication. But uh, I think what, what's really important in terms of the, uh, the, the, the action here is we're moving from a linear economy to a circular economy and across to a regenerative economy. And we do have a good range of tools there, which are just moving into that regenerative area. Working Group 1 looked at uh, a number of themes. We looked at, uh, I won't read them all, but place is incredibly important. We looked at well-being, carbon, economics. And within the four working groups of the, uh, sorry, the sub four subgroups of, of the working group, each looked at their particular avenue against the, these uh, working group themes. And we ended up with a number of visions. The uh, working group on definitions it wasn't exactly a working group, it, it was a, um, a piece of work which has developed o over the over a, a number of people. But we wanted a language of sustainability that removes confusion, so we know what we mean by carbon negative, we know what we mean by restorative. The social working group looked at um, social, health, participation, well-being, etc. The vision was well-being and love through awareness of the planet. And that's the, the group where the eco Siva uh, model came from. Then we had a group looking at the uh, living heritage. And the, the um, sustainable, sorry, the vision there is a living heritage with sustainable function, materials, and accessibility. Active buildings that do more good. And then finally, the uh, sustained growth from a regenerative circularity, from a regenerative economy. As I mentioned, one of the ideas was to um, look at what the trigger is. How can we get to those visions? And th th this is just pulling four down. There's many more in the, in the publication. But education, yeah, number one. 
if we had people coming into the, the, the built environment without the background knowledge, we're all starting from ground zero each time. So inspiring the next generation for me and for others is this either reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with our environments through biophilia, for example, biomimicry. Um, yeah, a vital trigger. And then place. We need that human-centric, a culturally rich, ecologically sound built environment. A building which relates to its place. A built environment that relates to its place. And ideally one building should not be able to transport to another, another place because it works and is rooted in that one place. And then the economy, moving from that linear to circular economy. Um, in the working group we've uh, produced a number of papers uh, contained within the publication. Um, I just did mentioned that the training school was held in Lancaster last week. And we, we took uh, a quotation from uh, Leopold, Ardo Leopold, to teach a student to see the land, to understand what they see, and to enjoy what they understand. And we had 30, 35 students and about 10 lecturers and guest lecturers uh, over four days. And we did a couple of case study, uh, case study visits. Um, and it's good to see some people who are at the uh, training school here, here today. And so these are some of the quotes, and that, that top one for me made the whole four days of putting the training school together incredibly worthwhile. Um, I, I shouldn't put the names on here, but uh, they, they were saying, I believe this is the beginning of something bigger and totally revolutionary. Now, if we can get that into every student, that, that should be our vision. Um, and yeah, I should give thanks for uh, people who have stuck through the, the the year of working group one. As uh, a, a reminder, Carla, that we, we started with 49 people. Um, I think by the time we got to fire, there were about 30 of us in the room, and it's dropped down to a nucleus. Not this is not this is not everybody, but it's dropped down to a nucleus of uh, 20 or so who are active in bringing this together. So uh, a, a big thanks to, to those. Okay, a couple of announcements. Um, we've put together a really nice little publication, uh, an infographic, which will be available to download from the Restore website, which is a plug for the website, eurestore.eu. That should be up today. Once we've uh, made any final changes. But, uh, essentially, it's uh, the, 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 the issues I've mentioned in this presentation. But the, uh, the, the good news is delighted to announce it last the actual publication. Um, this will be available very soon. Um, and it's grown. It's gr it actually contains 114 pages. And I'm very pleased with the, the, the work which has got, gone in, into that. Um, yeah, it will be available to download very, very soon. And, yeah, final slide. And for me, this is what it's all about. Imagine a built environment that only provides a function, that stuff we did in the past, improves people and planet health, enriches prosperity for all, and is more beautiful than the one we already have. So uh, I, I think we'll all agree that's where we want to go, and that's where every Restore wants to go. So, thank you.